Amen. This is indeed uh, the day that the Lord has made. The Bible tells us to rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm glad today that uh, I have health in my body. I'm glad today that I am able to rejoice with God and thank him for taking us on a little vacation and bringing us back. We got a chance to see another part of the planet that God has made. Got a chance to um, to experience a little bit more of God's beauty. Amen. And that's always fantastic. So I want to thank God for that. Thank the Lord for that. Well, I want to welcome all of you again into um, House to House Bible Study. Um, as I said, I think I have a wonderful word from the Lord. Uh, parts of this will be a familiar word, but I'm asking the Lord to give me the words with which to communicate it in such a way that you hear it with different ears and that it resonates in your heart and touch you a little bit differently. Not only so that you will remember, but also that you might be able to communicate it to others that they too will hear from the word of the Lord. Amen. So wonderful, wonderful. I'm reading from my text is, is from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 11. Um, this is the faith chapter of the Bible. There are many others, but this particular chapter is regarded as venerated even as the chapter that uh, reminds us of what faith is and what God requires of us. I'm reading the first three verses, Hebrews chapter number 11, verses one through three. I could actually read all 40 verses because they, they, they address this topic tonight. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is the ESV version of the Bible I'm reading. This is what the ancients, referring to their forefathers, this is what our forefathers were commended for, the writer of the book of Hebrews says. Verse 3, he continues, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So what is seen, listen to this, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that's in them, was not made out of things that came from here. I want you to get that. They were made from things that are not visible. Amen. That's not my focus, but that just tickled me a while ago. And I thought I'd repeat that. Amen. So let's go. Uh, the operative words in this portion of scripture, I believe, and if you have the King James Version of the Bible, it says, um, it's the it's the word substance for confidence and evidence for assurance that was substituted there. Uh, the operative words in this portion of scripture are confidence and assurance. As I said, the King James substitute the word substance, right? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence for assurance of things not seen. Uh, so I was thinking, why, why these words? Why choose these words? And what I think the writer of Hebrews 11 is saying, it is your behavior, your actions, that reveal the true depth of your faith, that is your convictions. So faith is sometimes referred to, I'm sure you've heard, uh, uh, as blind faith, meaning like a child, just blind faith, knowing that his or her father, his or her mom is there for them, blind faith, and, and rightfully so, because uh, I really like that phrasing because it says, the expectation is that you act, you act before you have the full evidence of what you're acting on. That's blind faith. That's believing God. That's taking God at his word. And this is really the opposite of how we normally do things. I want you to think about that for a moment. Normally, we want to see the, the, the forecast, the 90-day performance, maybe the six-month performance of the, the stock or the fund. We want the 12-month performance, the track record 
or what we used to call, we still do call the ROI, the, re, the return on investment before we commit dollars or write a check to purchase the stock. Isn't that what the investors say? The investors say past performance is the greatest predictor of future performance. But Jesus is turning all of this on its head. And he says, before you see the results, before you see my answer, I want you to commit now. I want you to commit before you see the results. Uh, I, I, that hit me. I loved it. And I read recently an amazing description about an African animal from the antelope family known as the, the impala. Uh, these animals come from southern and eastern Africa and are well known for their amazing ability to jump, to leap. They can jump to a height of over 10 feet without much effort. One can leap uh, a distance of greater than 30 feet. Yet, yet, these magnificent animals can be kept confined in a zoo and closed with only a three foot high fence as a barrier. How? The reason is that these impalas, it, it is said, will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will land. Isn't that interesting? They will not jump over the three foot fence if they cannot observe where their feet will land. That's a wise and conservative approach to life. In other words, don't jump if you can't see where your feet will fall. You know, you know, we have an old adage in English uh, in our lexicon that contradicts that, don't we? We, we say, look before you leap, right? We want to see where we're going to land before we even jump. Come on now, follow me with this. This informs the normal approach we take when taking risks. It also informs uh, my title tonight, which is Leaping Where You Cannot See. <laughs> I want you to jump first, even though you don't know where you're going to land. So that's my title, Leaping Where You Cannot See. How's that for working definition of faith? Being sure of what we hope for and certain, certain now of what we do not see. Uh, this is the very opposite of look before you leap. Hmm. Look before you leap. Faith, according to Hebrews and the rest of our Holy Scripture, is jumping first without being able to see where our feet will land. Mm -hmm. There is a, there's a time-honored story of a little boy on the second floor of his house. The house is en engulfed in flames and burning quickly. His father calls down, uh, calls up to him saying, Jump, his father says, I will catch you. But the little boy cries back to his father timidly, but father, I can't see you. His father says, yes, I know, but I can see you. Jump. That's the kind of faith the writer of the book of Hebrews is recommending. Confidence in knowing that God's got you. Confidence in knowing that father will catch you. Right? And jumping anyway, even though you can't see him. Isn't that crazy? I love that. And, and beginning with the eighth verse of this chapter, the writer of the book of Hebrew gives several examples of such faith. He, he writes, quote, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, and did, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For... He was looking forward to the city of, with a foundation whose architect and builder was God. 
Abraham we now regard as a man of faith because he went where God told him to go, even though he did not know where that might be. He was not a man of faith because he believed in God. Watch this. He was a man of faith because he believed God. He believed when God made him a promise. But then, but then, watch this. He acted on it. He packed up his stuff. And I know I taught on faith a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, before vacation. Uh, uh, but but this is a different take on it. I want to show you that what 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 really happened here. He packed up his tents and he called out to Lot and he called out to all of his family members who were with him. And he was like, listen, y'all, we leaving. And they said, where are we going? He said, I don't know, but we leaving. So what's our destination? I don't know that quite yet. God is going to lead us, but we are leaving. He lived in tents in the wilderness because he believed that one day God would provide for him a home in a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And that faith, people of faith move regardless of their uncertainty when God says move. So my question to you beautiful people is, how are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? Has God told you to move recently? Have God told you to maybe start a Bible study on your block? Maybe start a, a small group with your friends and family? Do you understand that there are still people of such faith in the world today? People who will act. They will do before they had understand all of the details. It is our modern sensibilities that cause us to want to know all of the details. I was an analyst, so I get it. You know, we, we do research and we do market share and we do forecast and, and we look into our so-called crystal ball is what I used to say. And, and we tell our subscribers, we tell our customers what will be. <laughs> oh, God help me. And when I was in high school, I learned of a man by the name of Lech Walenska, kind of my one of my heroes in a way. Some of you may recognize his name. The younger folks in here might not. I want to tell you a little bit about his story before his name is forgotten and his contribution to history is erased. In 1980, Lech Walesa was an unknown electrician working in the shipyards of Dax, Gdansk, Poland. Uh, the G is silent. At first, he was not a man of any deep religious faith or belief. In fact, he referred to himself as a delinquent worshiper. Isn't that interesting? He says, and I'm quoting, I pondered upon God's existence and looked for signs to confirm that God exists. But faith did not grow in me until life got harder for me. End quote. I'm sure that some of us can also make a similar claim that your faith in God did not grow until you came under pressure. Then you believe God, right? Then Lequalensa added these words. He said, quote, the more difficult my path became, the closer I came to the faith, meaning the closer he came to believing God when he was under pressure. And few people could have been less likely instrument of God than him. Uh, once a priest had told him when he was in school that if he did not change his ways, he was gonna spend his life in prison. Well, he did spend time in prison, right? The communists who took over Poland restricted his activities out of fear of his influence over the people in Poland. It was amazing that a man who was such a poor speaker could ever have such enormous influence. And if any of you remember the influence of Lech Walesa in the 80s, I can tell you, it was palpable. If you listened to the news and was paying attention to what was going on in Poland, 
He writes, I was incapable of saying anything in public. My, my tongue used to outrun my mind and I was able, unable to keep track of the words I had said. I would always speak before I thought and therefore I was a public, a poor public speaker. But a man by the name of Harold Van Smith wrote in a book called No Fear of Trying said, Walesa had a brain and he had friends with hundreds. He was friends with hundreds of other workers in that shipyard. And he had a conviction that the communist government of Poland was corrupt. And he dreamed of a time when workers could unite and do something about the unjust society in which they live. And so in August of 1981, Lech Walesa stepped forward and founded the Solidarity Labor Union in Poland. And this set in motion an inevitable confrontation with the Polish government. Soon, he found himself followed by the secret police and so on. Eventually, he was arrested and confined to his home because the authorities attempted to break the power of the Solidarity Party, Solidarity Party that he had founded. But then something happened to him, something almost transformational when he began to speak about his convictions, while well, of course his Polish was rough and his, he was not always grammatically correct, but when he spoke, it was authentic and the people listened. And overnight he became a symbol of courage. In his writings, he said, quote, I am convinced that my faith had a powerful impact upon me during my time of imprisonment, my, my time of confinement. And he said, our Lord distinguishes each of us from all the others. He assigns a task for every person. And he says, I simply believe in providence. I believe that I'm here to execute the verdict of providence. And that is precisely why I can accomplish what I have accomplished without God directing my, my steps. Nothing would be accomplished. And he says, it's good to have the awareness of that great force of God outside of us, above us, directing our lives. Later, when the communists were overthrown in Poland, Walesa was elected president of Poland. His impact was enormous. And remember, he presided over Poland's transformation from a communist to a post-communist government in Poland. He was not a great politician. Remember, he wasn't very well educated. And this became a problem. His, he had a blunt manner of speaking. And so as a result, his presidency didn't last very long, but no one has challenged his deep faith or his commitment to seeking to serve God as best as he's able. Wasn't he afraid during those days when he challenged his government? Well, Lessa himself answered that question like this. He said, deep religious belief eliminates fear. Because of his faith in God, he had no fear. Now, please do not misunderstand. Walesa is not a perfect man. He's simply a man of faith. He, he simply sought to serve God. We know of another guy like that, Abraham. He too was not a perfect man. Go back and read his story in the early pages of the Bible. The Bible says that Abraham heard, heard God's voice telling him to make a difference to leave his home and go to a place that God would show him. And he did. That's faith. Jumping without being able to see where our feet will fall. Uh, not because we're reckless or foolhardy, but because we're heeding God's voice. God's call, if you will. The world is desperate for people like this. We've got right now a world full of greedy politicians and, and empty promises and barren prophets. So, so who's speaking for God at this time? 
These are hard questions, right? Who, who's speaking for God? Some of you may remember uh, a motion picture, remarkable motion picture, uh, that came out about two decades ago, maybe three. It was called Amistad. Uh, this film was based on a true story of a group of African slaves who were brought to this country in chains under the most inhumane conditions imaginable. They were imprisoned on the Amistad ship. And as the ship neared the U.S., one of the slaves, a man called um, Sinque, was able to free himself with, his, with the help of other slaves. They overthrew uh, their captors, took over the ship. However, not knowing how to read maps, they were, trick they were tricked by the ship's crew and were subsequently recaptured and taken in chains to New Haven, Connecticut. There's a movie about this. Steven Spielberg, if I'm not mistaken, uh, made the movie. They were put on trial as murderers and thieves. And over the next 27 months, these survivors of the Amistad began a new voyage through the court system of the United States. In the end, former president of the U.S., John Quincy Adams, defending Cinque and his fellow slaves before the United States Supreme Court. And in his closing speech before the Supreme Court, John Quincy Adams spoke these words. Quote, last night I spoke with my friend Cinque. I told him what was to transpire here today. He told me, as was the practice among his people from his land. He said, I began talking to my ancestors who are now long gone. And they told him all would be well. Then John Quincy Adams turned to the members of the Supreme Court and added these words, quote, Your honors, as I stand before you today, I believe we would do well to learn from Cinque. We would do well to talk to our ancestors. Adams went on to invoke the names of the founding fathers of this country. He also went on to invoke the names of the early Supreme Court justices, one by one. When he called out their names of, of these great men he would, he, who had sat in those same seats as the justices he was addressing, after calling out each name, he would say, gone, gone. When he finished calling out all of the names of, their, of, of these illustrious predecessors, he looked at the Supreme Court and said, all of them are gone. Who among you is ready to step into their legacy and defend freedom? Who among you is prepared to take the place of our ancestors and become great in the name of God? And this great nation once again. Adams was issuing a sterling reminder of the faith that their ancestors had in freedom and a challenge that people of this time demonstrate that same kind of faith. Remember, America was, was founded upon revolution. And one week later, the court delivered its verdict with only one dissent on the court. The justices stood tall and exonerated the Amistad prisoners. The court declared that the Africans had never been lawful slaves in America and that they had been kidnapped from their country illegally and transported to this country. So their mutiny was therefore an act of self-defense. Now, now this is an amazing story of courage on the part of uh, the court and of course of John Quincy Adams, who later became a president of the United States. Uh, my, my thought is that, would that happen today? We don't seem to have very many men and women of, of that kind of courage today, particularly in our leaders in the government. Think again about what Adam said. He invoked the names of the great people who had been responsible for this free land we inhabit. He asked, where are they now? And his response rhetorically was, gone. They're all gone. So hear his words again. All of them are gone. Who among you is ready to step into their legacy 
and defend freedom? Who is prepared to take the place of our ancestors and become great in the name of God and this great nation once again? Former President Adams was expressing the same sentiment as the writer of the book of Hebrews that we just read. The writer of Hebrews cites his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And later in the same chapter, he, he cites Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Rahab and Gideon and all the great heroes and heroines of the Bible who stepped forward when the times demanded it. And the writer says, friends, that's faith. That's what it looks like. It's not simply just believing God. It's serving a living God. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is jumping even when you don't know where your feet will land. <laughs> you, you, you are jumping when you cannot see your father's arms ready to catch you below. This reminds me of, um, Vinice will remember this, it reminds me of a story in our lives when we lived in Monroe, North Carolina, when we first moved here, Bethany and Caleb were like four and five or five and six or something like that. And uh, I wanted the kids to learn how to swim, right? A skill that every human should, should pick up. Um, the world, you know, our earth is surrounded by water, right? Everywhere there's more water on the planet than there's land. And so uh, we live, we didn't live very far from Wingate University. So the women that were serving as our, our babysitters at the time all had come from uh, Wingate University. And so um, we asked them about whether or not there was a pool there, whether there was uh, swim, swim lessons being offered. And they said, yes. And so we took the kids over there for swim lessons. And so one of the first things they teach you in swimming is can you can you put your head under the water and not take in water, not breathe in water, because we can't breathe water. So that's one of the first tests. So dunk your head, hold your breath, right? So that went fine. And, and um, one of the next thing that they did was um, they went into a, a little deeper area of the pool and they said to all the little kiddos, Jump, we will catch you, you'll be all right. Um, Bethany, Bethany stepped up and I'm in the pool at this point cause she's like, no, nah, I'm not doing this. And she carried on a little bit and uh, I'm like, okay, I got this, I'll jump in. And, and, and I said, jump Bethany, I'm here, I'll catch you. You will be fine. Well, you know what happened, she carried on and ultimately did not jump. I was heartbroken, but she wasn't going to do it, right? She she didn't trust me. No faith in dad, no faith in dad. Caleb, on the other hand, just jumped off and he was younger, of course, and had less fear and jumped in. And, and, and to this day, he's a better swimmer than Bethany, right? So, so if we're going to accomplish anything, sometimes we need to leap first exercise some faith and jump first, knowing that a loving father is right there to catch you. And right now our world sorely needs people of faith today, people who will stand up to tyranny, stand up to the bullies, stand up and jump. Uh, do you not sense it? We have real problems, staggering problems that our politicians will, will never confront because they're afraid of what they're going to lose. So they'll never jump. We need people of integrity, people of courage, people of candor who will do the right thing, not expecting anything back, not the expedient thing. They will do the right thing. This brings us to really our conclusion of the matter. If, he, if, if you and I do not champion God's kingdom, who will? That's the thing about heroes and heroines of faith. They're not very special in their own right. 
They're special because they believe God and they act accordingly. That means that you and I could be heroes of faith if we would, in fact, heed God's voice. And, and if not us, then who will do what needs to be done? Dr. Mickey Anders tells about a very intriguing program that was on the radio sometimes back on a program called This American Life, hosted by John Hodgman. He conducted an informal, unscientific survey in which he asked the following hypothetical question. If you could choose, which would you prefer? And the choice was the power of flight, you could fly, and the power of invisibility. Think about that question for a moment and decide which you would choose. Would you rather be able to fly or be able to become invisible? My guess is that when you were children, uh, most of us, right, longed for these abilities, these gifts. I know I did. You either wanted to be invisible, particularly when we had to, when we had done something wrong. And who hasn't desired to fly like Superman? Right. So, which would you choose, and what uh, would you do with your newfound superpowers? Would you be a real superhero, or would you be super selfish? And in this research. John Hodgman found uh, surprising results. He said, no matter which power the people had uh, he was talking to had chosen, they confessed that they would rather use their newly discovered powers in purely self-serving ways. Their plans weren't heroic at all. No one wanted to use their powers, say, to put an end to crime or to bring people to uh, into hope. Instead, he found that his interviewees concocted schemes on how they would use their new superpowers to satisfy their own personal desires for wealth and fame. Typically, it went like this. People who chose being invisible would seek uh, would sneak into movie theaters or steal cashmere sweaters at fine department stores or spy on their coworkers or stalk their exes or hang around people's showers or eavesdrops on conversations or slip into airplanes for free rides. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and people who chose being able to fly would, would, would then stop taking the bus. They would just give up their cars. They would check out the bar scene and fly in and fly out hoping to gain attention. They would then fly off to Paris or to Prague or to Rio. And when they have chosen to use their powers to do uh, heroic things, instead, they always chose something trivial and self-serving. Absurd, you would say. Well, apply this information to you and me. What courageous heroic action have you taken in the past, say, 60, 90 days? The question is, why not? Why haven't you done something heroic? Of course, you and I can't be invisible and we certainly can't fly, but still, God has much for us to do. Remember when President Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as the president of South Africa, of South Africa he quoted some words that convicts us all, even today. Here's what he said, quote, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's a scary thought, isn't it? We are powerful beyond measure. We can do things. You and I could do heroic things. If we, if we dared to jump, to live out our faith. We could change our family, change our community, change even our world. All we would have to do is be willing to jump even when we cannot see where our feet may fall. All we have to do is be willing to work towards the coming of the kingdom of God in a world full of confusion and doubt. No, instead, like the African Impala, we have imprisoned ourselves behind a three-foot wall of doubt. And I'm done. Uh, I'd like to just quote this one last time. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, 
when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Why? For he was looking forward to this city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That, my friends, is faith. That is the kind of faith that God is looking for people who will jump even though they're not 100% sure where their feet will land. Amen. Are you willing to do that tonight? Are you willing to jump into the arms of God? Not exactly knowing where your feet will land. That's all I have for you tonight. I hope this word has encouraged you. I really do. I hope you feel as though there's something there for you. Amen.